Good evening. My name is Boon Hua, and I'm the conductor for Opus Novus, the contemporary music ensemble here at Yongshu To Conservatory of Music. Welcome, and thank you for joining us in this live stream concert from our beautiful concert hall here in YST. We are delighted to bring you an eclectic mix of music tonight. The program will begin with a work by Kaya Saliaho, one of Finland's leading composers today, titled Lishbogen. The title was inspired by the northern lights in the Arctic sky, and this is an evocative meditation on sound and colors. Singaporean composer Emily Ko, who will also appear as my co-host for tonight, is currently based in the United States. Her work, Transmigration, was written in 2010 in memory of Dr. Stephen Baxter, the conservatory's founding director, and this year marks the 10th anniversary of his passing. Lastly, Paul Hindemith's Kammermusik No. 1 is quite a riot of a work, and he challenged the conservative status quo and broke new grounds by combining mechanical rhythms, popular dance music, and unusual instruments such as the accordion and also the police siren. Thank you again for joining us, and I hope you will enjoy this concert as much as we enjoy preparing it.
The first piece you have just heard is um, Lischbogen by Finnish composer uh, Kaya Sariaho. And I'm very happy to introduce uh, my co-host for tonight, Dr. Emily Koh. Uh, Emily is currently Assistant Professor of Composition at the Hugh Hodgson School of Music, University of Georgia. And she's also a proud alumni of YST. So welcome, Emily. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Really happy to have you. So Emily, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your experiences with Sariaho's music? Mm -hmm. So as a composer, my experience with Sariaho's music is that it's very, very colourful. Uh, you know, the timbres and you know, the way she writes for instruments is always very interesting how you know, new colours and sounds get picked out from the ensemble. But many, I guess, composers you know, who write in a colourful way uh, are good at that. And that's very, really common these days. The thing that sets Sari Aho apart, though, is that she's always been very economical with her use of instruments. So whatever you see on stage sounds much more than what it is. And I think that is also very true in Lichtbogen because we only see a flute, a harp, a percussion, and five string instruments on stage. But I think the colors that we get from uh, the ensemble sounds as if there are many, many more strings and a much larger ensemble than what we see. Mm -hmm. And part of this, I think, is due to her use of electronics in this work, uh, because the electronic sounds are used to amplify and magnify the little colors that she writes in the instrumental parts using extended techniques that usually wouldn't be heard because they're too soft by amping up the electronics and amplifying these interesting extended technique colors, she actually creates a new color palette for the ensemble uh, that then she uses to compose a piece that 
becomes much more than what we see. Uh, so that is something that I've always found interesting and true of Sari Aho's music, and I really, really respect her for that. Absolutely. And I think the use of electronic in this piece is really quite different from uh, kind of how many people will use electronics. Um, so usually what happens is people uh, will record something and then they will insert it at various points of the piece. However, for uh, Leash Bogan, um, you might not see this on stage, but there's a, actually a sound engineer sitting off the stage and actually manipulating the sound, the distortion or the echo effect that you will hear uh, from the, the performance that you've just heard. And uh, this is really quite fun because that creates a lot of possibilities and you know live interaction between the electronics as well as um, the, the the musicians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree, and it really does help with us imagining, uh, say, uh, Aurora Borealis, which some say inspired this work, right? The the like Lichtbogen is basically light arcs, and we can imagine these like many colorful. Uh, skies when we imagine the piece as an aurora borealis. Absolutely, and actually for me, it's really more about kind of the um, the, the personal uh, emotions when you see something so magnificent. Uh, this this beauty beyond words, and I think she really expresses that beautifully in her piece, uh, where you hear some of the most um, wonderfully intricate sounds. Um, and uh, yeah, great. Well, I, I mean, one of the things that hit me when I heard, you know, uh, Leif Bogan again, after knowing that it's being programmed on this uh, concert, is that we both start our pieces the almost the exact same way. Absolutely, right? yeah. Sari Aho starts with a flute, a very airy flute, and then, you know, on F sharp, right? And that is exactly how I started my piece. And I promise I did not copy her work it was just you know serendipitous that we did the same thing but i think both our pieces uh, moved in very different directions after that absolutely yeah. so i mean since you we moved on to your piece i would love to ask you can you tell us a little bit more transmigration and also uh, what we are listening for in your piece mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I wrote Transmigration in 2010 and 2011 as a new graduate student at Peabody uh, on a YST Peabody scholarship. So I was very thankful for the opportunity to continue exploring and uh, studying music uh, under the auspices of YST. And so I decided to write a piece uh, then to you know talk about my experiences moving from Singapore all the way to Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Uh, that you know explains the migration part, and you know I also wanted to pay I guess tribute to uh, a Peabody dean and also the founding director at YST, Dr. Stephen Baxter, who had recently passed in the uh, summer. So this piece is uh, a memorial almost for Dr. Baxter. Well, when we listen to this piece, I think uh, we can hear a lot of romantic aspects of the work. And I think that's mostly rooted in the way I controlled um, chronicity in this piece. So at that time, I was taking a song analysis class, studying a lot of Schubert songs, Schubert Lieder. Mm -hmm. And the, I guess, tonal arc of the piece is very much inspired by how Schubert uses modulation. So, you know, a lot of I guess, common tone modulations and mix mode mixture, but that uh, expanded uh, through my 21st century lens of what Schubert had done. So that's kind of how I, I organized the work. So there's a lot of tonal centers that we move through and each tonal center is actually a whole color world of its own. And uh, that's how I you know, organized the piece. And since you know we're talking about this piece, there are a lot of YST people involved in the creation of this piece. And I don't know if you know Boon Hua, but you were actually one of them. The bass trombone, fluffy, growly sound we hear at the end was something that you showed me when I messaged you and said, you know, what are some cool sounds that a bass <laughs> trombone can do? And you showed me this thing. I was like, this is perfect. This is how the piece ends. Mm -hmm. And it did make it into the piece. So thank you so much, Boon Hua, for that. And also the premiere of this piece involved two of my uh, YST colleagues. Uh, the first is Kyuhei Lim, who is a pianist and also my roommate at that time. 
and the second was Alan Chu, who is another YST alumna. So, you know, this piece is really near and dear to my heart, and I'm so glad it's going to get performed at YST after 10 years. Absolutely. I'm really happy that we're performing this tonight as well. So without much further ado, we'll move to the second piece, Emily Coast Transmigration. Thank you. 
moving on to the last piece for tonight, uh, Hindemith's Kama Music, number one, Opus 24. Uh, you mentioned Hindemith is one of your favourite composers, Emily, and I'm really curious to find out why. Yeah, um, so I was actually introduced to the music of Hindemith at YST. Um, I was uh, studying bass with Mr. Gunadi at that time, and also, you know, playing all the usual bass works like Eccles or Kozubitsky. Uh, but because I was a composition student uh, studying bass, uh, Mr. Gunadi decided to introduce a work that he thought would be more suitable uh, that was in the 20th century for me. And that piece turns out to be the Hindemith Double Bass Sonata. And over the years, you know, it's a piece that I play over and over again because I just love it so much. There is some, um, you know, interesting tonal colors, satire. But more than that, I think uh, in Hindemith's music, there's always this dramatic arc, uh, some sense of storytelling uh, in his music that always draws me in. So, for example, in the third movement of the bass sonata, uh, Mr. Gonadi and I wrote a whole novel about the piece and how the piece depicts a drunk person that ends up in jail eventually. <laughs> and that really helped me picture the, the dramatic arc and musical arc of the piece. And since then, I've always just viewed Hindemith's pieces that similar way. Hmm. Because when I was at Peabody, uh, my master's thesis for the music theory pedagogy program, uh, I wrote a paper on the differences between Hindemith's two editions of the Marian Leben song cycles. He did one song cycle, or he did the songs, he wrote the song cycle in 1923. And then several years later in 1948, he did a very massive edit and revision to that song cycle and republished it. So wow. the differences between these song cycles were um, my thesis, but not to go into the song cycle itself, uh, but really just his music. With song, it's very easy to understand where stories are. So my interaction with Hindemith's music has always been about drama and storytelling, uh -huh. which I think is actually really different from how I approach Kama music. Because to me, Kama music is completely different from any of the pieces that I just mentioned, in that it doesn't really have that immediate sense of drama that I would have expected with my experience from Hindemith. Uh, but what about you, Bunhua? What's your experiences with Hindemith music and how does that relate to Kama music? Well, um, I think everybody has their introduction to Hindemith via his sonatas. I think he wrote uh, for every every instrument or at, at least every underappreciated instrument. So I know the trombone sonata, the auto horn sonata, the tuba sonata, um, and, and those are really fantastic and pedagogical works that, that also, you know, teach us a lot about storytelling, as you have mentioned. Uh, my, other, my other exposure to Hindemith's music was actually from his orchestral stuff that, um, that I love a lot. So for example, his um, Symphonic Metamorphosis uh, on the theme by Weber, as well as his Matisse de Mahler Symphony. Um, I think those pieces are really masterworks that are un unfortunately underappreciated, underperformed these days. So Kama music uh, is a completely uh, different idea and Kama music you know, came at a, a point of his life where he was really writing in a completely different style and uh, some people might call this style neoclassical uh, which really means that he's moving away from his you know, Germanic romantic tradition and writing something that is completely uh, um, maybe in some ways sarcastic, but you know, a, a sneer at towards the olden times. And um, for example, in Kama music, the first movement you hear is this great uh, abrasive energy that starts off and in a really high energy and high octane kind of um, uh, writing, which is really exciting. And um, it, in some ways, I, I at first when I heard this piece, I almost didn't believe it was Hindemith. Um, and I thought it might be like Kurt Weill or you know somebody from the 1920s really writing in a in a style kind of for the for the people for the vernacular, and uh, you hear kind of a foxtrot theme thrown inside. You hear a march kind of thrown inside, and it's really exciting. And to me, it kind of established him as the bad boy of uh, of modern music back then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think in addition to the satire and uh, sarcas sarcasm that you were talking about, mm -hmm. you know, the, the title Kama music uh, basically means chamber music. But in all seven of his Kama music pieces, it's not any of it chamber at all. 
I would say every piece of these seven has more than 10 players and requires a conductor. Mm -hmm. So in a way, he's using the title and, and poking just at what we you know, thought of as traditional you know, 19th century chamber music in a way as well, which I thought was really interesting. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I think this piece was premiered almost 100 years ago at the big music festival in uh, Donau and Schengen. And uh, I'm sure it must be a big shock because people come to the concert expecting Kamu music, you know, something nice. And, you know, what they hear is this, you know, onslaught of, of powerful and really fun. I mean, this is, this is a really, really fun piece. And I was actually introduced to this piece um, by a friend. Uh, who used to play uh, violin at the uh, Ensemble Modern, which is one of the top contemporary ensembles in the world. And he was telling me about this piece being a great pedagogical piece as well because uh, there's a lot of fun and there's a lot of uh, interesting sounds that the ensemble is being exposed to. But at the same time, it's also incredibly... F um, uh, uh, incredibly good to work on because there are a lot of rhythmic complexities uh, that gives a lot of uh, room to the students to you know kind of chew their teeth on so i'm really happy that we're closing this program with uh hidden myths common music number one and uh, i'm sure everybody will have a blast listening to it because it's really a, a, a riot of fun it is it really is so without much further ado and uh, i'd like to thank my co-host tonight uh, dr emily ko thank you for your wonderful uh, music and also, you know, jumping on to this together with me. So yeah, without much course, further thanks ado, thanks for having me. Yeah, without much further ado, come a music by Hindemith. <laughs> 